Welcome everyone to our Climate Friday virtual town hall on clean, accessible transportation. We all depend on it. We're grateful to have with us today, Taria McComer, who is the electric vehicle director for Grid Alternatives. She leads Grid's new clean mobility network and manages the California Air Resources Board's one-stop shop pilot project for lower income and disadvantaged communities and works for zero emission, safe and inclusive transportation systems for everyone. And welcome Woody Hastings, our energy program manager at the Climate Center. He's been an energy and environmental policy analyst, strategic planner, and community organizer for 30 years. He has served as staff to the LA County Metropolitan Transportation Authority Governing Board and is a former member of the Bay Area MTC Policy Advisory Council, including serving as chair of its Sustainable Transportation Committee. We're excited to have you both before we begin our presentations. I just want to welcome all those of you who may be new to the Climate Center. We were founded in 2001 with a mission of speed and scale greenhouse gas reductions. We're probably best known for the key role we play in growing community choice energy from two CCAs just five or six years ago to 21 CCAs today that serve 11 million Californians with 88% clean energy. This is the headline from a couple weeks ago. We're all experiencing it with record-breaking heat, wildfires, and devastating smoke. It's time to address the climate crisis. The governor recently acknowledged it. We are in a climate emergency. The nation and the world are looking to California to lead for a climate safe future. A couple weeks ago, the governor said we have to fast track our goals and what we believe will be the first of several new executive orders. He announced a ban on new sales of gas powered vehicles by 2035. It's a great step in the right direction, but not enough based on the latest science. The, uh, some studies have come out recently that show that we have already activated nine of 15 global tipping points on climate change. And the United Nations scientists have told us two years ago, very conservatively, that we have to cut emissions in half by 2030 and we have to start drawdown of the more than trillion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents of global warming pollutants we've already dumped in the atmosphere. So we are working with partners across the state on Climate Safe California to accelerate existing state goals so that by 2030, we achieve 80% below 1990 greenhouse gas levels and net negative emissions where sequestration is greater than emissions and we are starting drawdown. We have two key principles that guide us in this work. All policies under the Climate Safe California efforts must ensure a just transition for workers who are dependent on fossil fuel enterprises. And we need to work together with the building, construction, and other trades to keep creating jobs and solve climate change together. The second key principle is closing the climate justice gap. We need to ensure that lower income communities are no longer disproportionately harmed by fossil fuel development, production, and use and prioritize lower income and communities of color in climate safe policies. We recognize that climate justice is racial justice and that we need to ensure that everyone can participate in the clean energy economy. We invite you today, if you haven't yet, to endorse Climate Safe California as individuals or as organizations. We hope by the end of our Climate Friday, we will have at least 30 new endorsements. We'll let you know at the end. You can go to climatesafeca.org it is a public pledge of support for California to accelerate aggressive, equitable climate policy. And what we do here in California will inspire other states and countries to greater action for a climate safe earth. So welcome again to Taria and Woody. We will now start with Woody Hastings and I'm going to exit here and hand this off to Stacy, who will be running the slides. Let's see, I have to stop my share. There you go. Okay, Stacy, you have those slides? Thank you. Take it away, Woody. All right, well, thank you very much, Ellie. Glad to be here. And thank you all for joining us. Some of you may know me as the Community Choice Energy Guy, but I've been a regular transit rider, so I have some personal experience and I have some transportation policy experience, so I'm happy to share some of the highlights about the Climate Center's Emerging Sustainable Mobility Program. There is a lot of info and hyperlinks in some of these slides, so don't worry about speed reading all of it. 
The slides will be shared with you and you will also receive a resources sheet in the materials. Next slide, please. You can go to the next slide. Okay. By way of overview in the presentation, I'm going to talk about the Climate Center Susta Sustainable Mobility Program, offer a definition of what we mean by sustainable mobility. Uh, I've got some suggestions of some principles of sustainable mobility. We'll go over some of the current realities and touch on some of the state and local policies, the transportation funding, and lastly, go over some of the prospective actions to achieve our climate goals. Next slide. Woody, can you pause for a second? Because sure, um, sure. we are seeing the present presenter mode. So oh. we see all of your notes in the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to. Yeah, go to slideshow. Uh, just the uh, full screen. Yeah. Oops. That's still presenter. Left corner, yeah. Just use slideshow. There you go. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. Uh, so let's see, I think, yeah, there we are. So we already got a little bit of this, but let's not forget why moving rapidly to clean mobility is so important. We are already in the age of consequences of the climate crisis. This is San Francisco on September 9th, shrouded in the orange glow from the unprecedented wildfires, undoubtedly exacerbated by global warming. So uh, next slide, please. California's current emission target of 80% below 1990 levels is, as Ellie said, too late. We need to get there by 2030. This, this means going from the current approximate 429 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, or MMT for short, to the goal of 86 MMT, assuming we also have that ef effective sequestration of 100 million megatons um, through health healthy soils and habitat restoration. The Sustainable Mobility Program is part of a three-part phase-out fossil fuels program. The Climate Center has several key elements for its Sustainable Mobility Program that aims to reduce emissions from the transportation sector by 70 to 85 percent, depending on other sectors. I'll try to simplify things a little bit here. The dot in the upper left of this chart is that 1990, you know, what is, uh, you know, su such and such numbers by 1990, uh, below 1990 levels mean? That little dot uh, in the upper left uh, is the 1990 benchmark that's always being referenced, and the uh, 424 off to the right is the actual 17, 2017 level, and the two uh, lines show the difference between the current California goal compared to the Climate Center's accelerated goal. Next slide. So a big part of achieving those reductions is phasing out gas cars, and that was what we were going to be spending a lot of time uh, next year uh, in our program on in Sacramento. Uh, we'll still be spending a lot of time in Sacramento, but as most of you know, by now, Gavin Newsom signed the executive order this past Wednesday calling for an end to sales of gas cars in California by 2035. Now, this will still require legislation to get it into law, uh, and the executive order makes that legislative act much easier. Uh, but remember, this is just a goal. The hard part is making it a reality. Next slide. So we need to redesign our cities to be smarter and more livable and lower in greenhouse gases, avoiding the need to travel much by car, if at all. We need to improve amenities for active transportation, which means walking, biking, and micro-mobility. And I'll talk about what that is in a moment. We need to switch to clean transit, but a, bu a clean bus costs about twice as much as a diesel bus. So it needs to, uh, that's gonna need some government su support, some incentives. We need to reduce unnecessary travel. Think about it, in the three R's of waste management, reduce, reuse, and recycle, reduce is the first best thing to do. So we need to reduce vehicle miles traveled. We need to continue the current trend of virtual presence uh, when that's appropriate and acceptable, like in this case, today, here, now, uh, and make it accessible for everyone. That means making uh, broadband universally available. And, you know, COVID has helped us uh, learn that quite a bit and learn the degree to which some folks don't have access to broadband. Next slide. So those actions uh, all help us advance sustainable mobility. In terms of a, a definition, you know, there's a lot of definitions actually out there. And I gleaned from what's out there and like to offer the following, that sustainable mobility is a transportation system that is not dependent on fossil fuels or other finite resources. It's clean and non-polluting. It's a just system. 
uh, and accessible for everyone where spending is equitable and stakeholders have meaning partic meaningful participation in decision making. Next slide. So there are several principles that should guide sustainable mobility. Principles such as social equity, accessibility, and affordability. Travel should be safe with clean or zero emissions, and there should be a ro robust public participation in decision-making, call it transportation democracy. Budget priorities must align with climate, social equity, and other policies. This is not necessarily a complete list. I've included a couple of links to additional principles from other organizations in the resources sheet uh, in the materials you'll receive. Next slide. So why a focus on transportation? In the blue section at the bottom of this diagram, you'll see that the largest source of greenhouse gases in California is from the transportation sector. The chart further breaks it down so that we can see that our cars are most of that, 28%, the dark blue uh, part. Um, and it is going in the wrong direction, slowly creeping up at, a, at about 1% per year, even though California's overall emissions have been going down, uh, the, uh, the transportation sector up. So next slide. Now of that 28% of passenger vehicles, about 22% comes from a, a very sm relatively small number of vehicles. About 80% of the emissions come from just 20% of the vehicles on the road. So there's some low hanging fruit, but it's not easy to pick. To retire the older vehicles, we need programs that offer clean mobility options uh, for lower income folks. And we need policies to discourage people from buying enormous SUVs. You know, there's about 200 million SUVs in the world. And if they were their own country, they would be the seventh larger, largest greenhouse gas emitting country in the world. Next slide. So in order to reach the 2030 target, we need to take about two thirds of the gas cars off the road. There are about 15 million cars in California, but currently there's only about 730,000 EVs. Next slide. So, you know, one way to accelerate the adoption of EVs uh, is, and this is proven that uh, you can ramp up that adoption if EV drivers themselves share their experience, you know, neighbors sharing with neighbors you know, what, they, what they've done and sharing test drives. So um, that's what Drive EV is all about. It's an annual event every September and it actually starts tomorrow, very timely. So happy to share with you that tomorrow uh, it starts and you can check out driveelectricweek.org for an event near you know, of course, this year they're mostly virtual this year, but there are opportunities out there to test drive EVs, certainly at dealerships. Um, now to charge all of these vehicles and other things that are being electrified, we need to greatly increase our clean electricity generating capacity. So we'll talk about on that on the next slide, please. Community choice agencies are leading the charge on building new renewable energy in California. There are now over 20 operational community choice agencies serving over 11 million customers in California. On the map, all of the green and green yellow hash areas are where CCAs are operational. Many of them have electric vehicle charging or uh, uh, charging infrastructure uh, or vehicle incentives. So check with your local CCA. Next slide. At the state level, most transportation policy is decided at the California Transportation Commission, the Air Resources Board, and in the State Assembly and St Senate Legislative Committees. Much also happens at the local level, and this is a great place to engage. Next slide. So at the local level, you can help support a number of good policies. One of them is called the Complete Streets Concept. This concept depicted in the scene behind me is in alignment with our sustainability principles. It means getting away from the idea that roads are just for cars. Complete streets have sidewalks with curb cuts so that they are usable by someone in a wheelchair or any other wheeled device. Um, they include uh, dedicated and clearly marked bike lanes. They have safe crosswalks and plenty of green spaces. Next slide. Now, there are many other land use and transportation planning uh, decisions that are made at the local level that impact the quality of life and greenhouse gases. Currently, most local governments still have obsolete 20th century permitting rules on their books that allow development that pours fuel on the climate crisis fire. 
including permitting new gas stations like their ice cream stands. Especially with yesterday's executive order, they are also bad investments. We need to stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure, and that includes gas stations. Next slide. At the state level, Caltrans is currently receiving public comment on their long range plan. Now is the time to weigh in and demand that they adopt measures that accelerate greenhouse gas reduction, reduction in ways that are aligned with sustainable mobility principles. You go to uh, ctp2050.com for details on that. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, funding. Uh, so the chart, uh, this chart from the state's legislative analyst office shows how most of the funding for transportation improvements in California currently comes from gas and diesel taxes. So if we are gonna radically reduce gasoline and diesel use, some other means of generating revenue must be identified. Vehicle mile travel fees or road use charges based on how much you drive have been suggested as a viable alternative. So we'll be looking into that. There are also policies to consider like congestion pricing and parking fees if there are ways to implement them equitably. Next slide. So this chart for also from the state's legislative analyst office shows that about two thirds of new funding uh, via 2017's SB1 for transportation improvements is going to highways and roads. Now, of course, we need to maintain uh, our roads, electric vehicles drive on the roads too, but much of these funds are spent on expansion of roads and freeways. In total, California has a $27 billion transportation budget, and the current spending priorities do not align with the state's climate goals. The priorities need to change and prioritize public transit and active mobility. Next slide. So transit agencies across California are grappling with a triple whammy from COVID. Steep declines in ridership of 70% or more in many agencies unprecedented revenue shortfalls, and um, increased expenses from new health policies. In pre-COVID times, I was a transit rider to get to and from work, but my office went virtual back in, uh, in March, and uh, I work from home now, and I enjoyed using transit. It was my social media time. Uh, I got some exercise walking to and from my bus stops. Um, you know, if you remember anything from this presentation, it's this. We all depend on public transit because we are all dependent on the people who rely on public transit to be where they're supposed to be. Workers at hospitals, healthcare centers, schools, grocery stores, and other service sector operations. Public transit, and also I just wanna point out, public transit may not be much of a COVID risk. Um, a recent scientific article uh, explained that contact tracing uh, has found that public transit is not a high COVID spreader. So you may wanna check that out, it's in the resources sheet. Next slide. So I wanna to touch on a few trends out there. Uh, one trend that's actually undermining transit, ride hailing, which creates a problem, emissions and congestion, and a decline in public transit ridership. We need to invest in more transit and incentives for carpooling or also known as ride sharing. Um, you know, apps that could be designed to help people that are already going from point A to point B to share a ride, not create a new ride. Now recently Lyft and then Uber announced that they're gonna be going full electric by 2030 and that's okay, but we need to address supporting public transit and relieving congestion. Next slide. So there have been a, some trends over the past few years, not driven by policy, but driven by technology and demographic and cultural changes, micromobility. We've all seen these various gizmos out there zipping around on the streets and sidewalks. Micromobility is great purely from an emissions perspective, but there are public safety issues that have emerged. So there's gonna be need to be more work on that. Next slide. So what do we really need? We need a well-designed system that is safe for anyone from eight to 98, regardless of race, ethnicity, or gender, including people with disabilities, to be able to navigate the transportation system safely. Next slide. The transportation uh, transition is an extremely tough nut to crack, and there will have to be some radical transformative things for us to get those emissions down fast. If the transition from horses to cars can be considered progress, a hopeful experience from history is that the transition to cars after, you know, they had been around for a while, uh, but uh, it, it, the transition 
took place mostly within the first decade of the 20th century. And in the 1900 photo on the left, it's almost all horse-drawn carriages and pedestrians. But by 1910, the photo on the right, it's almost all streetcars, automobiles, and pedestrians. But the transition this time must be equitable. And uh, I'd like to now hand it off to Terea, who will talk about that further. And so final slide. That's my contact info there. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Woody. And as Taria is getting up her slides, I just want to remind everybody to put any questions you have into the Q&A and uh, also uh, welcome you to endorse Climate Safe California at Climate Safe California, climatesafeca.org. Thank you. And now hand it off to Taria. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Taria Matt Comber, and I'm the Electric Vehicle Director at Grid Alternatives, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, for the folks that are on the phone or possibly on Zoom too, um, I am a Black woman, and um, I will start this off by saying that um, I might get emotional during my presentation. I have had a very hard couple of days. And um, as we collectively grieve, um, over 200,000 people uh, passing away from this uh, global pandemic, as well as the continued um, injustice and humanity and inhumanity of Black folks um, in this country. Um, I just ask that you all bear with me if um, emotions do arise. Um, so I'll just jump in. Uh, grid, uh, we are a solar company, so a lot of people ask, like, when did you start doing transportation? Um, but we do want to make sure that transportation is clean, um, just like Woody's presentation says, um, transportation emits a lot of greenhouse gases into our air. Um, so we want to make sure transportation is sourced and fueled uh, without emitting GHGs. Uh, we want it to be inclusive of the many forms of mobility that are needed by different individuals and communities. So uh, what he went over, uh, public transportation, electric vehicles, um, thinking about our rural areas, um, electric vehicles um, are really important. Our suburban areas also will rely on electric vehicles. Um, and we still want it to, all of this transportation to be accessible because just like energy, healthcare, education, housing, Transportation is the movement. It's movement of people getting to and where they want to be. Um, and it shouldn't be based on whether you can afford it or not. Um, so I'm happy to say that our projects are touching on these. Um, and I'll touch on how I'm doing this through my project uh, with CARB on the One Stop Shop. But I want to take a moment to dive deeper um, into uh, what my heart is telling me um, about transportation and why just cleaning up our transportation is not enough. Um, so in 2019, we marked the 400th year that African men, women, and children uh, were first brought to this country. Uh, captured people began their journey, sometimes walking as far as 300 miles to the coast before boarding a ship for their 5,000 mile journey across the Atlantic to America. Clean mobility transported 10 to 12 million African people as non-humans um, over the course of 300 years in the form of uh, wind transportation. The year is 1849. Harriet Tubman has successfully escaped slavery and walked to freedom from Maryland to Philadelphia. The journey is estimated to have taken her almost four weeks to complete. Harriet and hundreds of other enslaved people escaped inhumanity through our most inherently inclusive mode of transportation, the ability to walk and carry those who can't. It's a hot, humid summer in Bluefield, West Virginia, a rural town on the edge of the Virginia state line. A bright-eyed 18-year-old Black man is boarding a public and accessible form of transportation, a train, to meet a family friend in Chicago. 
He carries a new suitcase that his parents spent their entire savings uh, from their minuscule sharecropping salary on. And it is one change of clothes, some fried chicken, a few slices of bread, and a piece of cake. He really loved his mother's uh, cake. His parents had been warned that during his journey to the north, the train and the stations did not serve black passengers at the diner car and sometimes didn't have colored bathrooms or water stations at uh, the train station. After a week of traveling in the same clothes, saving his clean clothes for when he made it to the north, rationing the food he had brought with him and staying alert to survive the journey through Jim Crow South, my grandpa, Velo Wright Sr., made it to Chicago in 1953. And I just do want to note that this um, picture was taken by Theodore. Um, his last name starts with a G, and I just lost it. Um, but Theodore uh, uh, documented uh, the Freedom Riders um, in the 50s and 60s, and he actually passed away earlier this year from COVID. So with these three narratives, I, I hope to exemplify the three goals of our projects at GRID, but also to reflect on how they are not enough. My journey to Oakland for graduate school included a nine hour drive from Las Vegas, uh, the week after Sandra Bland was murdered while in police custody. Like Sandra, I was driving to a new opportunity, better life. My parents hugged me tightly as I said goodbye. I observe a lot of focus on the technology behind electrifying transportation. But the question I have for us today is how do we leverage this inflection point to create a clean transportation system that allows for the movement of people, people that are able to be their embodied authentic selves freely and abundantly. With the ongoing coronavirus pandemic where Black people are being disproportionately impact and impacted in part due to being essential workers like Jason Hargrove, a Detroit City bus driver that passed from COVID on April 1st. With the protest against racism, where sometimes the only way for our pain to be heard is by shutting down freeways, the same structures that cut through our communities during redevelopment. With the constant fear that any Black person, myself included, must deal with while driving, riding public transit, or even taking a walk around our neighborhood to get out of our house during quarantine, or sleeping in our own homes. Transportation holds much higher stakes for the Black community in the United States. I've been listening to a podcast called The Untold Story of Policing and Sam Sinyagwe um, from Campaign Zero uh, shared a statistic uh, from their research and of the 30,000 interactions of, uh, with police in this country, 24,000 of them are uh, traffic related. So movement, in a car, walking, biking, um, can, it's just a big deal. As I sit here today, knowing that my ancestors used, but were also victims of clean, inclusive, accessible transportation, my question for myself is how do I leverage their resilience to build a liberated transportation system a system built through recognizing the blood-stained floorboards of ships, the footprints in the soil, the colored only signs on buses and trains, and the thousands of miles driven for a better life. I believe and I hope that I've started to convince you all as well that as we collectively reimagine what mobility looks like in our country, that these experiences inform us in every decision we make. Because my life and the lives of those that look like me are counting on it.
So I wanted to start my presentation like that because I believe that I was given this opportunity to lead the One Stop Shop pilot project because that is the perspective that I bring into uh, making uh, clean transportation accessible to our most deserving communities, including communities that look exactly like me. So One Stop Shop comes out of the SB 350 barrier studies. Um, part A was done by the California uh, Energy Commission and uh, Part B was done by uh, the Air Resources Board and both state as a recommendation that we need a really easy way for folks, our most deserving folks, they call them disadvantaged communities, but I call them most deserving uh, to access this technology. One Stop Shop is a pilot project. We started in uh, October of 2018, so we're about to turn two. Um, and we basically have three years to prove that by streamlining outreach and access to CARB's clean transportation equity programs, that we might be able to reach some of these goals. So our goal is to increase uptake. Um, we want to do that by um, first bringing awareness to the, our communities. Um, when disadvantaged communities were defined, they completely uh, forgot or just didn't realize that tribal communities are also disadvantaged communities um, and they're rural, um, but it, it really shows the, the lack of diversity, the lack of inclusivity at that table as we were defining how we were going to create equity programs in this state. So we need to create intentional awareness, awareness uh, through outreach that reflects the communities that we want to um, understand that these funds are out there and that these vehicles are accessible to them clean transportation is accessible to them. Uh, we hope to do that, um, you know, by having programs like the uh, LCT programs available. Um, once, you know, there's more awareness in the community, people start buying these vehicles or start riding uh, this type of mobility, we're hoping to show to uh, OEMs, uh, to local governments that, hey, uh, the communities that deserve it the most, they're not afraid of this technology, they deserve this technology, and you should invest in this technology specifically for our most deserving communities. So for our pilot, we're focused on two strategies. One, coordinated outreach for the equity programs. Equity programs are, have done an amazing job, um, but they're still pretty siloed. Um, so we'd love to help reach these 2030 goals, these 2035 goals, um, by making sure that we are creating a really coordinated way of speaking about uh, clean transportation, um, but also making sure we're intentional and uh, we're inclusive in that outreach. We're not just throwing flyers at people, but we're going into communities and saying, hey, transportation is a big deal here. Um, we see you don't have um, buses or a, a, bus, uh, a bus station here or uh, a pickup place. Why is that? Um, and how can we make sure that this is um, brought up, surfaced uh, to the state, not just um, to your city council meetings, but to the state where billions of dollars are coming out? I mean, $14 billion was invested, uh, is being thought to be invested next year, um, but we only see about $1 billion uh, for equity programs. And, and we know that not a lot of people in this state are um, uh, over middle, middle income. The second uh, strategy of our pilot is a streamlined user-centered application process. So um, once folks know these programs exist, know this technology can be accessible to them, how are they gonna apply for it? I'm really excited to say this morning, we were approved by CARB to uh, create an income verification process that no longer um, makes people prove as hard as it is to continuously prove that they're poor. Why do we have an income verification system that makes people jump through hoops to prove that they need help? Um, so I'm excited that this morning 
uh, we were basically approved to pilot a really easy income verification process. So like I said, coordinated outreach, it's um, statewide. I'm just gonna jump to the next slide since I know I'm tight on time. Um, but we at GRID have uh, GRID regional affiliates across the state, so we leverage um, these amazing offices um, to do outreach for us. We're also working with SEIU, Liberty Health Foundation, and then two uh, tribal organizations where Blue Lake Rancheria is a tribe, and then Native American Environmental Protection Coalition um, is an incredible uh, member-based organization of uh, tribes recognized and non-recognized, whatever that means, um, and uh, really supporting these uh, reservations and these communities in, in becoming more climate resilient. As indigenous communities are already um, environmental stewards um, and stewards of our land. So strategy two, a lot of people like to focus on strategy two because it's uh, how do we make sure that these uh, programs are accessible. Once folks know about it, how do we make it really easy for them to apply to the program and receive the grant? Um, and it's, I say it's kind of the sexier part of our work because um, we're building a website, we're building a web tool um, that, you know, makes things really easy. Civic tech is always really fun to, to figure out uh, for government. So this web tool uh, we use, we created an eligibility engine. So on the back end, it's a really complicated matrix, um, but on the front end, we've taken two years to work with our communities uh, to really figure out what does this website need to reflect for you to trust it and for you to be able to easily use it. So I have a quick video um, that just shows what it's like to go through the site. Um, this is our homepage, you can see what you need to do to go through it. Ask a few questions to understand where are you living? Are you buying a new car? Are you trying to trade in a car? What's your estimated household income? Do you have family um, that lives in a home? So are you possibly eligible for solar too? Um, we're wanting to use this tool to start to build a model um, for uh, the state of California to be able to create a climate resiliency like common application. So not only can you get clean transportation, but you can also um, get solar. Um, you can maybe get battery storage. Uh, you can maybe get um, energy efficient windows. So how do we make all of that really easy for our families and our communities that are already bombarded with life uh, to apply for and get, these pro get into these programs, get these grants that they deserve the most? I'm just going to jump forward. These are the current programs that are in uh, the a part of the One Stop Shop um, and listed on that web tool. Um, the one that's probably um, folks maybe not know the acronym, but DAXASH is solar. It comes from the CPC. It's the statewide low income uh, solar program. So this is our timeline. We're right at the fall. So we've been calling ourselves One Stop Shop for a while, um, but as of uh, the end of October, we will completely have changed our name, so keep an eye out for that, as well as a, a public website where you all can all go. Um, the, the eligibility engine is still going to be password protected, and that's basically because uh, programs aren't ready for, uh, not ready just yet uh, for as much uh, interest as we know is out there, so we're just taking um, a couple more steps before we make that eligibility eligibility engine public, but the website will be public so you can find out ways to become an outreach partner or um, get in touch with us if you have a program um, in your area that you would like to be listed on the tool. And then 2021 is going to continue to do that intentional uh, inclusive outreach that really reflects the communities that we're trying to serve. Um, if we go beyond being a pilot, um, we are really hoping to start to include a lot more programs. So we're starting with shared mobility, we're starting with uh, EV, you know, incentive uh, programs, but we want to include charging. We've already included solar. We want to include more shared mobility programs, and then we want to continue to build in all the climate equity programs that are coming from the state. So it's a really great common app for folks to understand what's out there, what they want to engage with, and how to easily get uh, the grants that they deserve. 
So I'll pause there. I think I'm at like 17 minutes. So um, I'll stop and just say thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you so much, Taria. Really appreciate that. And the extra time you gave for the personal perspective is uh, incredibly valuable for everyone and needs to be heard and shared every day. So thank you so much. Uh, and thanks also again to Woody for your great presentation and overview. So let's get into some of the questions here. I'll start with a question for Woody Orteria. Please address the challenges and opportunity for rural communities as well as older populations, whether urban, suburban, or rural. Thank you. I, I'd like to kick in on that first, if I may. Um, I mean, I'd like people to think about the fact that there, there's a reason why we have the U.S. Post Office. <clears throat> and the reason why we have the U.S. Post Office is because people like Ben Franklin recognized that the private sector would not be able to provide, uh, uh, you know, uh, thorough uh, universal access to, uh, um, you know, postal service mail uh, in, in the private sector because it's not profitable. You know, I watched the Nixon-Kennedy debates in 1960, and they talked a lot about the rural uh, electricity, uh, rural electrification. And that was a government program to make sure that folks out in rural communities uh, were got electricity. And we did, still didn't have full electrification of the US in 1960, right? So what I think we need for rural areas is a rural transportation program of the government. I'm, you know, I believe the government can, can serve and can do well. Uh, you know, I believe in you know, good government. And so I think what we need for uh, the rural areas and other, uh, you know, underserved uh, communities is a program that is funded, the public program that's funded to reach these hard to reach areas and to provide services for in far flung areas that are aligned with sustainability uh, that um, are clean and that are accessible and affordable for folks. Taria, did you want to add anything? I, I think the only thing that I would add is that we need more. Um, I think I'm looking at a lot of these questions and, and what I'd love to see is, you know, more planners as a part of this conversation. Um, I think that is, you know, it's a great point to think about our suburban and rural areas and how much um, planning is really focused in urban areas. Um, and also the need for planning to, to become a little bit more inc inclusive in especially suburban areas as we see gentrification uh, happening, gentrification displacement happening across the country around the world really. Um, so planning is it's pretty fun and sexy in, in urban areas, but uh, what about our suburban areas as well as our rural areas? A follow-up question for Taria. Will this tool that you showed be available to all folks and can cities create links to it for their qualified residents? Yeah, so we are hoping before our pilot ends next October for, for this tool to be uh, completely able to be used by the public. Um, we would love for this site, our site to be embedded in as many places as possible. Um, we love to include as many programs as possible. Um, we are doing our due diligence because we're funded by CARB. Um, we would love to open it up to everyone right now, but we're funded by CARB. So we have a commitment to CARB uh, to make sure that their programs are ready for this to be public. And we're working really closely with the staff leads over there uh, to make sure the programs that I listed out um, are ready to um, receive as much interest as we know is out there. Um, this piece of civic tech is, is one that um, I think can really be a model, uh, not just for California, but for other states that are, are looking to, to help transition all of their communities uh, to a cleaner transportation future. Thank you. Um, what seem to be the obstacles to pop-up bike and pedestrian lanes, which seem particularly cost-effective? Would you wanna address that first? Obstacles to pop up a bicycle, you know, um, or maybe opportunities as well. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's an emerging uh, concept, and I think that uh, you know, I, I haven't looked into that uh, myself in, in great detail. So that's something that we would probably be addressing as we 
uh, develop the st sustainable mobility uh, program. Um, you know, change of any kind, uh, it can cause folks to, you know, scratch their heads and, you know, wonder what's going on or, or, or to resist something that they're not familiar with. So um, I think that it's a, it's a function of, um, you know, making people comfortable uh, with, with what some of the changes are. And I see we've got somebody from the Bicycle Coalition, Eris Weaver, who could uh, answer one that, answer that in the chat. Okay, great. Um, and another question for both of you. How does the new executive order from, <clears throat> excuse me, from Governor Newsom uh, requiring 100% uh, ZEV sales of new cars and trucks by 2035 help expand accessibility to lower income communities of EVs or other alternative uh, clean mobility options? Taria, you wanna take a swing at that? Um, I don't, I, I think executive orders are limited in, in you know, <laughs> what they can do. Um, I think it's a great goal in saying like, hey, we need to, you know, clean up our transportation. Um, it does focus on new car sales. Um, and we see that in our um, lower income communities, our communities that uh, need transportation the most, um, they're not always they're not usually buying uh, new cars. Um, so uh, I don't know how much of this goal is gonna really get us to where we wanna be. Um, and you know, the implementation of things looks a lot different. Um, and that's where I hope that um, some of the practices that we're, we are uh, creating with One Stop Shop um, are able to spread across agencies um, that will be implementing this work so we can make sure that um, all of this investment is, um, I would say all of this investment is for communities that deserve it the most. You know, Woody mentioned that, you know, most of the investments are coming from gas and, and diesel um, taxing. So as, as that revenue decreases, um, you know, we should definitely look for other revenue sources, but we also have to figure out where we want to invest. And if we continuously are creating programs, this is, you know, this is me taking off my grid hat for a second, if we're continuously creating programs that are for the general public, and we know the general public um, is really the majority, uh, you know, the majority of people that can access, quote unquote, the general public, uh, then we know where, uh, we, we know where uh, perspectives stand. So as we lose revenue due to reaching our goal, we should be investing all of our dollars into making sure that our communities that deserve and need and rely on transportation the most um, are being supported in the transition to clean transportation. And I'm gonna, sorry. Or, sorry, I was gonna add an example. As we see new electric buses coming online in LA, look at where those buses land first. Are they landing in Southeast LA and Compton? Are they landing in Beverly Hills? So just a couple of quick things to add. You know, the executive order is, is an executive order. It still needs to go, the legislation will need to be passed uh, next year to, to codify that. And, uh, you know, the goal will, in all likelihood, the core of it will remain in place. Uh, you know, uh, the details uh, will be, um, you know, come out there. And I, so I think some of those um, equity issues could be addressed there. But let's also remember, the thing here is not to just wave a magic wand and switch out all of the gas powered cars with electric vehicles. We need to transform our transportation sector and you know, make, you know, transform it into something different so that we're not needing to get into vehicles and get into a congested area. You know, uh, we need to reduce vehicle miles traveled all the way around. And I did want to thank Eris Weaver of the uh, Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition chimed in with a better answer to, to that previous question about pop-ups, which is that the main resistance where they've tried to do the pop-ups in, in, in this area in Sonoma County has been resistance from city staff. So it's important, again, to engage in local government at the local level, um, get to them to understand what it is you're trying to do and that it's for everyone's benefit. Thank you, Woody. There's a follow-up question to that. Um, are there a set of templates for local policies that like what you're referring to? Or is that something that needs to be developed so we can help uh, accelerate the adoption of clean transportation alternatives? 
Sure. I mean, there's 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 uh, uh, organizations like ICLE, the Institute for uh, International Council for Local Energy Initiatives, and other uh, Institute for Local Self Reliance, and other organizations and institutions that, uh, and you know, there, there there are there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of examples, and there are you know models in existence in in other parts of the country, in California, and other parts of the country, and in the world of where they've done things that have worked. Uh, and, you know, I, again, I wanna emphasize local level because so many of these things start in our cities and counties uh, and then they expand from there. Um, you know, I just, I, just the other day uh, on a thing with uh, a, a California Energy Commissioner, uh, David Hochschild, and he really referenced the seven cities that initiated the solar mandate. Uh, in their own towns, and then they, you know, saw that those policies working, and so in, in this year, you know, all new uh, homes have to have solar uh, starting this year, and so that things like that come start at the local level and find their way up. So I think it's important that we um, do that, focus on the local. Great. Um, how do we get more charging infrastructure? We we know that uh, clean vehicles are not just electric, but there are hydrogen opportunities and maybe others. Um, how do we make sure that there is the charging and fueling infrastructure, especially in more densely populated areas and for people who are in multifamily housing? Tere, would you like to start on that one and I can maybe add or I could, I could start? You could start, Winnie. Um, so you know there are multiple uh, uh, you know multiple efforts uh, underway to expand EV charging. One of my uh, oft repeated things is that we really need to make electric vehicle charging uh, visible. Uh, you know you drive around any town and you see gas stations, but you don't. It's very hard to find the EV charging, and I think that's important not so much for EV drivers because they learn how to find where the charging stations are, but for gasoline car drivers that uh, don't, don't understand or believe that EVs are viable. So I think that's super important. In the resources sheet I provided, you know, there's the zero emission vehicle mandate. There's, there's funding coming through from a number of different sources in the state uh, on expanding EV charging. The, clean, the community choice energy agencies have programs to expand EV charging, particularly workplace charging where people uh, you know, have their cars during the day uh, when we have sunshine and we, so we want to soak up that solar energy charging batteries and not necessarily just charging at home. So things like that. Um, you know, we will be talking a lot about funding EV charging in our sustainable mobility program. So a lot more to come on that. Great. Taria? Um, one effort that GRID is has is um, we were a part of a few other partners that were awarded SOMA, which is Solar and Multifamily Affordable Housing. Um, so something we're trying to push for, and it's, um, it's a little bit harder because we're working directly with uh, developers, is as you're putting solar into these communities, might as well, while the trucks are out, build a couple of charging stations, put in some charging stations. Um, I do want to recognize that just like transportation, uh, charging needs to be put in places that where people are safe. Um, so, you know, right now charging is uh, so, um, so inaccessible and it's just very, very small amount of charging stations that we would need to get to our 2030 goals. But looking at where these charging stations are, Whole Foods, um, parking lots, you know, far away from the door, far away from light. So as a woman, I don't know if I could charge there. I feel comfortable charging there at night. Um, if you're, um, you know, a tall black man, um, I don't know if you feel comfortable charging at a Whole Foods deep in, uh, you know, if you're in the Bay Area, if you're closer to Piedmont, I don't know if you'd want to take your car to charge there. Um, so just recognizing that still we're, we're striving for a sense of belonging and how much easier all of this transition would be if we didn't live within uh, a country steeped in uh, systemic racism. So uh, unfortunately, we have to keep that perspective on our minds as we think about where charging will be, um, who will install it. It's an incredible workforce development opportunity to think about who is gonna install the charging, uh, where is the charging gonna be sourced from, um, and where is it gonna be placed? Great, thank you. We have a couple questions about um, 
more conservative local governments and more rural areas. One from Chico in Butte County, where they've had three climate related disasters in less than three years. It's rural. They're in a new District 7 that's in the 91 percentile of disadvantaged communities per the state's definition. How do they get some help? Maybe Taria, that might fall. I'm not sure. But how, how do we, I mean, a, a part of that question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Um, the question is how do we get more rural areas? Um, funding, investment? Yes, particularly when the local government is more conservative as well. Definitely. Um, you know, collective action works. <laughs> we see that around our country. Um, I think I saw uh, Mayor Ray Leon on the call, and he's done an incredible job of uh, speaking truth to power whenever he has the chance. So, um, you know, it seems a little easy to just say, let's try to speak truth to power. But um, on our project, we do our best to keep track of when public work groups are happening. Um, and we invite our outreach partners and others in our network to make sure that they um, know that the public work group is happening. Uh, when they were in person, we would uh, speak to CARB um, and ask if um, they could support this organization coming up to Sacramento. Um, just in case the cost was uh, prohibitive. Um, so I will continue to do my job on, on my project to make sure that these uh, work groups are, are accessible um, and also recognizing that collective action uh, really can get us there. Our, you know, a lot of people want to convince us otherwise, but uh, collective action is you know, how a lot of things have changed in our country and, and can change in, in your local government. And got to put a plug in, vote, vote. Make sure that your community is voting. Make sure three people around you are registered and are able to be registered to vote. Super. Thank you. I, I want to I add to that answer because there's some experience here. So I really am building on that, um, you know, what, what you were just saying to you, which is that, you know, the, the, the Climate Center in, in approaching work in, in the Central Valley and some conservative conservative areas, we actually commissioned a, a poll of the community there to find out if they cared about uh, climate, clean energy type issues. Uh, and we found that uh, super majorities, uh, uh, you know, two thirds uh, of, of, of folks, uh, uh, voters in, in, the, uh, in the Central Valley, in the Fresno area, Stockton area, care about these things across the board, care about clean energy, care about choices for clean energy, care about the climate crisis. And there's a disconnect between local uh, uh, you know, uh, the local government in some areas um, and, and their, the people, their constituency. Um, and so it is super important that the, uh, that the constituency be heard by those uh, elected leaders that are not, uh, you know, in alignment with, um, with what the people, you know, actually want. So I think if there were a more forceful engagement from, from the community uh, with their city councils and their boards of supervisors, that could make a big difference. We've seen it happen. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry that we are out of time. There are so many more great questions, but uh, I want to thank you so much, uh, Woody Hastings, Energy Program Manager at the Climate Center, and Taria McComer, uh, uh, electric vehicle manager for the uh, grids alternatives. Before we completely wrap up, and uh, I'm going to go over a couple minutes, I would like to ask each of you to, in one sentence, describe your vision and hope for the future in terms of clean mobility. Woody, you want to go first? We'll end with Taria. Well, you know, oh, yeah. I'm off mute. Um, yeah, a vision for clean mobility. You know, I, I think I, I said it earlier. It's it's sort of in the in the it's sort of the um, uh, principles that I laid out that we have a clean, affordable, equitable system that is uh, you know on track to achieve our climate goals. Um, we must do this. It's not something we really have an option to do. I think we must do it. So my vision is that we would achieve. Uh, such such a vision, and it's sort of depicted a bit behind me here that we have, uh, you know, a multiplicity of, uh, of ways of getting around, not just cars. Uh, so anyway, that's that's where Thank I can go on that. Thank you, Taria. 
Um, my, my vision of the future and one that I'm, I'm trying to build through my project already is transportation and, and mobility uh, that fosters and actively facilitates a sense of belonging for everyone um, and that uh, allows for the movement of people uh, regardless of if you have the ability to pay for it or not. So transportation as a right, not as a privilege. Thank you so much. So thanks again to Woody and to Tria for excellent presentations and a great conversation together today. We need hours more to continue, but we don't have that, unfortunately. So thank you for your time and effort and fantastic leadership. I also want to thank Janina Turner and Stacy Meinzen for staffing our webinar today. And I want to invite everybody to our October 7th webinar in partnership with the Sierra Club about lessons from a California community that actually said no to oil and yes to jobs, talking about organizing and getting local government to change what they're doing. Uh, it's about a Culver City victory and uh, lessons can be learned for not just around uh, oil wells and drilling in your neighborhood, but many other of these uh, urgent climate solutions that we need. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to all working together for an inclusive, equitable, clean transportation and clean energy future. Be well and stay safe. Take good care. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.